Hello, lovelies. Welcome to this episode of Lessons from the Universe with Jennifer All. I look forward to sharing my channeled message with you today. And if you love it, please remember to like, share, review, and subscribe. Welcome to episode 46. It is amazing to me to think about that. I don't know why this one hits me, but when I started this in February and it was one episode, 46 seemed like a lifetime away. Today, I want to talk about one of the most daunting and complex human emotions, the emotion of shame. It's not really that I want to talk about it. I have to. It's been circling around. It's been very, very clear. Uh, Leading up to yesterday afternoon, I had a lengthy conversation with a client about the emotion of shame. And then last night, I channeled, dreamt up with a acronym for shame. And the more I think about it, the more accurate it feels to me. So think about the letters that spell out the word shame, S-H-A-M-E, and hear this. Saturated humans assimilating manifested experiences. Saturated humans assimilating manifested experiences. People full of thoughts, full of unexplored emotion, taking in, attempting to understand fully what has happened, but so unable to take it apart because of, well, all the crap it means to be human. If you look at the definition of shame, it is an emotion that includes guilt, shortcomings, unpropriety, disgrace, and disrepute. (laughs) That's a lot. And so I thought it important to think about each part of that. Most importantly, because people confuse shame with guilt, and that's not accurate. Guilt can be a part of shame or a cause of shame, but it is not the same thing. Guilt is entirely different. Guilt is wrongdoing or failure to do your best. If shame comes from that, it might be secondary. But even more than that, shame from guilt is more likely to be implied than actual. And for those of you who've ever read the four agreements or heard me talk about it, this goes right along with one of the four agreements, which is that about assumption. When shame comes from this implied offense, this guilt, it is almost always and purely based on assumption, what we assume others are taking in from us, expecting from us, Shortcoming, (laughs) that one's pretty self-explanatory. But it is also often an assumption, a self-perceived diagnosis of who we are. Is it really a shortcoming? Is it really that big of a deal? And if so, then we can fix it, we can change it, right? Walking around in a state of shame implies that you can't change anything. Most importantly, unpropriety. Unpropriety is the failure to live up to some standard. Oh my gosh, this one's huge and it could be disseminated in a thousand different ways. It is some bullshit standard of conduct, of behavior, of appearance. Is it your standard? Is it what you really want? Does it really matter to you? Again, I'm reminded of one of the four agreements. Do your best and let it be good enough. 
you have no obligation to live up to someone else's standard. And quite frankly, in most cases, you are making up what that standard is. They are not. And almost without fail, anyone who decides that you are not good enough for them is really reflecting on themselves and concerned that you might find out that indeed they are not good enough for you. Disgrace comes up in the definition of shame. This is loss of reputation, loss of respect, and that sucks, right? Loss of friendships, whatever. But where that really grows from is from the need to be validated by others. Lao Tzu in Taoism, we have talked about Taoism before. It's a philosophy, right? Um, It doesn't get in the way of your religion or any other belief system, but it is wise. In Taoism, he says, care about other people's approval and you will be their prisoner. Boom. (laughs) I don't want to be anybody's prisoner, do you? No. The last one is disrepute. Disgrace and disrepute, they go hand in hand. Disrepute is reputation, not character. Those two things are so different. Reputation versus character. As I was looking at this definition, I remembered a quote that I literally had taped onto my computer monitor while I was a teacher. The quote Um, I Googled it because I wanted to be able to honor the correct human, uh, a gentleman named John Wooden. And he said, Be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Yeah, I like that. I was assuming whoever said that had to have written some spiritual book or self-help book or whatever, and maybe he did. But John Wooden was an NCAA basketball coach at the University of California. He won like 10 championships in 12 years. And when he was a player, he was an All-American like three times. He was this athlete, a coach like a literal coach, like a sports coach, (laughs) not a life coach. And his work, his teachings, so many quotes from him and something that then evolved into a uh, paradigm for success. They came through his very simple messages that he would give to his players. These things grew in and of themselves. And he said a lot of cool things, but nobody's perfect, (laughs) right? He did have um, something called the 12 Lessons of Leadership. And one of them was, your emotions are your enemy. I got to call bullshit on that one. Your emotions are not your enemy unless you allow them to rule your life. Yes, shame is an emotion. And it will probably touch you at some point in your life. If it hasn't already, if you don't carry it already, it will rear its ugly head. And that does not make it your enemy. Befriend it. Ask it what it has to teach you. That's what we need to do. In Buddhism, it is called hiri. The state of shame, the emotion of shame is called hiri. Um, I want to be silly and be like, hiri, hiri, pay attention. <laughs> but it is considered a skillful state, a spiritually useful emotion that actually leads to happiness and well-being because it realigns us with our ideals. Now, the overwhelming focus of what you would read if you were to look up Buddhism and Hiri and shame is that it's all about mistakes that you have made yourself. If you feel shameful for what you have done, you will go in and reevaluate and realign to what is your truth. Yes, absolutely. 
But the shame that I'm talking about today is not based on guilt. It is not for something you have done wrong. It is that thing that comes when you think you've let somebody down, when you don't love the person that loves you, when you are afraid to say no or any of the plethora of things, right? Or perhaps even the shame when someone has wronged you. It is not necessary that we are the ones who failed, right? It's not always in the traditional sense that we carry shame. But either way, it is an upgrade. If you feel that thing, you follow it. You find where it is sourced and you release and you let go and you grow and you learn and you change. You evolve. Don't let it own you. Don't sit in it. And sure, don't act on it. Don't do something that is not aligned with who you are because you feel that you may upset someone, that you may fail to live up to their standard, fail to get their validation. Screw that. You don't need that. Now, Christianity has a lot to say (laughs) about shame. And there are a few stories in the Bible that talk about it. Probably the most obvious being Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they ate the apple and immediately they realized they were naked and they wanted to hide. It says they were ashamed of their bodies. I disagree. I think they felt guilty. Because they broke a rule, a rule that they believed in, a rule to not touch those apples, metaphor or not. They broke that rule and they felt guilty. Guilt is I did something bad. I did something wrong. Shame is I am bad. Those are different things. They can go hand in hand, but if you are feeling shameful, like you are bad, you are wrong, you are not good enough, and there is no action, concrete behavior, choice, thought, whatever, that makes that a direct manifestation of your activity in life, It's not yours to feel bad for. You let that go. Understand. Shame can be a lack of self-forgiveness. Did you learn? Did you grow? Would you do it again? If the answer is yes, yes, no. (laughs) Yes, I learned. Yes, I grew. No, I would never do it again. Shame should be let go. Shame can be taught, a control mechanism. It is a time to search for those chattering monkeys. What are my thoughts? And who do they belong to? Who taught me I should be ashamed to wear shorts? Who taught me I should be ashamed to be exactly who I am, to like the kind of music that I like? Um, My son, to like My Little Pony, (laughs) right? Who taught us that we should be ashamed of that? Who was trying to control us, whether it was what we like or who we are? You don't have to carry someone else's beliefs. Remember, shame doesn't just suck the life and joy out of you. It robs you from the Life, the relationships, the experiences that are yours. Because in that state of shame, you are stating to yourself and to the universal flow that you are not worthy. And that if any of the people who thought you were knew who you really were, they would be grossly disappointed. And so we push others away. Shame 
is a lack of self-validation and a lack of self-love. Let's be clear. If you feel shameful because of something that someone else did to you, if you are angry at the wrong person, If you've been listening very long, you know how I feel about anger. I feel that anger is an emotion that we have when we're not ready for the other emotions. But if you need to be angry, get angry. If someone hurts you, if they raped you, if they robbed you, if they discredited your reputation, if they, no matter what their reason is, did something to you that makes you feel that you are not worthy, that you are not good. Get angry until you are ready. Until you are ready to face the hurt, to face the loss of the friendship, the job, whatever it is. To feel those other emotions. Do not just stay trapped. Do not just stay saturated. Shame saturated humans assimilating manifested experiences. The experiences that we have are manifest, period. They have happened. We need some looseness, some openness, so that we can assimilate them, so we can understand them fully, so we can learn and grow. And to be clear, understanding them firmly, (laughs) fully, doesn't always mean closure. You may not get closure from that human being, but closure will come From the what do I learn, how do I grow, and now I let go of it all. Christians, the Bible, has many stories. The one that comes to mind is the story of when uh, Jesus was out and he was healing people, right? There was a woman, she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Nowadays, we know a lot about medical health, and she probably has, like, you know, PCOS or something that we could help her with, right? Um, Any number of things. But in that time, she felt so ashamed of who she was. She, She felt unclean. She was too embarrassed to go and talk to Jesus. She touched the edge of his clothing. In the story, they talk about Jesus making her tell everyone what her issue was and that that somehow fixed it all. And it actually, in the story, if you read it, it it implies shame. I think it's easy to misread. Because I think by saying it out loud, she removed the shame. And sometimes that's what it takes. Say it out loud. Did you have an abortion? Say it out loud. Did you leave your husband? Say it out loud. Did you have a time in your life where you were on drugs or alcohol? Say it out loud. It's not everybody's business, okay? It's not like I want you to go around and and wear a sign. But remove the shame when you quit carrying it, when you quit holding it in secret, when you quit trying to pretend that you don't have anxiety or depression, that you're not afraid of whatever, that you're not lonely, when you quit trying to pretend that those things don't exist, what you find out is that there's nothing to be ashamed of. And you can lift those things off of you. You know, this kind of sends me on, a, I call it a tree thought, <laughs> right? A, uh, a lot of people cite uh, John 4, the story of Jesus drinking water with the Samaritan woman as a story about shame, right? She shows up, she's a Samaritan. That's like a different form of Judaism. And um, she's had five husbands and blah, blah, blah. And she goes up to Jesus and she doesn't understand, or Jesus sees her and offers her a drink. And she doesn't understand why he would want to drink with her. And people cite this as shame for who she was. I'm going to disagree with that one too. Because think about it. 
she is in this different form of Judaism and these two forms did not associate with one another. And here Jesus was like, hey girl, let's have a drink. <laughs> Water, okay. <laughs> and while they are talking, he sees who she is, right? This is um, more about what was conceived to be prejudiced that then turned out to not be. And then this chick being absolutely blown away by Jesus's prophecy, by his psychic ability. He's like, girl, you had five husbands, <laughs> right? And she runs off and she tells her friends and she brings them back to witness it also. Holy moly, this dude knows stuff. And yes, through that process, some were converted to align themselves more with the types of beliefs that Jesus had. Okay. You know, when a Christian says, seek to be like the Christ, right? Seek the Christ to overcome your shame, to overcome your fear, to overcome your sin, right? It really means seek the light within yourself. Remember, beloved, Christ was a title. It was not his name. His name was Jesus, right? In John 14, 12, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do greater things than these. Now, some people, I'm sure, are screaming in their heads and in their bodies and in their hearts and in their faith. What is she saying to me? But let's go a little deeper. The story of Jesus being given this title is cited in both Mark and Luke. Metaphysically speaking, Christ means the divine idea of man. So, when they gave the man Jesus this title, it was because they believed him to be the most perfect expression of the divine that they could imagine. And yet remember, you guys, Jesus was a human. He lost his cool more than once. He went into that temple and he flipped the tables. Can you imagine? <laughs> he went in there and caused a complete scene. And there were times that he was troubled, that he was sad, that he was confused, and that he felt lonely. He became frustrated when others didn't accept fully what he called the law. And he is cited as saying that he would spit you out if you were lukewarm. He cursed a fig tree. Do you know this story? <laughs> He had been traveling and he goes to get fruit from this tree because he's hungry and there's no fruit. And, you know, we can justify like he was tired. I can feel his pain. But do you know what he said? He said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, sure, some are going to say that's a parable and quite possibly so. But so was the story of George Washington cutting down the apple tree. It was a story that displayed his character. And Jesus was a man who started talking about the things that he believed in and then started getting followed by people and then started having people hate him for it. That sucks. I can understand him losing his cool. We all need to remember that. Release your shame. Jesus did some stuff that he probably wasn't too proud of, too. There's even a story in, uh, I think it's in Matthew, where he refuses to wash his hands before dinner. And the Pharisees totally throw shade at him. And you know what? He threw it right back. They cited some quote in the Bible about how you had to wash your hands. And he threw right back at them that they weren't killing their unruly children like the Old Testament told them to either. <laughs> yeah. 
it's okay. Look for the Christ within you, the divine idea that is you, that validates you, and everything will be okay. Like John Wooden said, adversity is your asset. It's your asset. It reminds you who you really are. So, yeah, maybe you cursed a fig tree (laughs) or you flipped a table. Maybe you did. Maybe that's a behavior. You're like, crap, I won't do that again, right? Or maybe it was just a perceived offense, right? There are people who ask questions about why Jesus decided to spit in the eyes of the blind, We know he could heal people by touching them or wishing it upon them. Why do you got to spit on the blind people, right? Or the story about the pigs, right? They say that, you know, he took the demons out of these men and sent them into the pigs who then ran off the cliff. I'm going to argue these weren't mistakes that he made that he should feel guilty for. (laughs) He might have felt some shame for it. He might have had that moment where he thought, oh, crap, people are going to think that this is shitty. People are going to think that my conduct does not live up to the standard by which my title of Jesus Christ should be. He might have had that moment. Maybe it was moments like that that sent him into the wilderness to think about who he was. And just like you and I maybe need to go into the wilderness, go into the quiet for just a minute, go into the depths within for just a minute and see, is there something in there I should feel guilty for? And if there is, let me fix that. And if there's not, let me release this shame and dis-ease I've been carrying around. Taoism frequently reminds us that we don't need to value the same thing as other people, and we don't need to avoid the same things as other people, that we are not required to believe what others expect us to believe, not even our mothers, our fathers, our husbands, our wives, our bosses, our children. The question is, are we brave enough Do we value ourselves and this life that we have been given enough to be unapologetically exactly who we are? It doesn't mean we never apologize. It means we let go of false morality, of the ropes and chains of others' expectations or what we perceive their expectations to be. We make no assumptions other than that if we are doing saying, being exactly what we believe is right for us, others will understand. And if they don't understand, ultimately they will learn something. We did not come here to make everybody happy all the time, despite what we have been taught, despite the shame that we have been taught. We came here to learn and to grow and to help others learn and grow. And sometimes that happens by force, intentional or unintentional. It is important, beloved, that you recognize when it is somebody else pushing an emotion on you, whether it is from sheer narcissism whether it is from actual fear that if you don't agree with them, believe with them, act like them, that they are not okay. Whether it is perceived failure, this idea that you are invalidated, whatever it is, the love 
comes from within you. The confidence comes from within you. You don't have to love who loves you. If you don't, you don't. And you don't have to be loved by who you love. It doesn't have to be that. You don't have to be perfect all the time. It doesn't matter if someone sees your weakness. In fact, they'll probably like you more if they do. It doesn't matter if you fail. Actual failure, maybe you go after that job and you don't get it. Or perceived failure, maybe you're just not a good singer, (laughs) whatever. Or maybe it's that feeling left out thing. That is invalidation. And that is more lack of self-love than anything else. If we get past our own hurt feelings, we'll see why we were left out. Either it was for our highest good, or maybe quite literally it was something we don't like. Is that something you really wanted to be invited to, or is that your worst nightmare? Are they really best friends, or do they actually stab each other in the back constantly? Joseph Burgos claims that there are four types of shame. I think that that's pretty limiting, but he says it's unrequited love, unwanted exposure, you know, being called out, perceived or actual failure, and being left out. And for the client that sparked this whole conversation today, for her, it was actually just a mistake, a misnaming of the emotion. She was calling it shame. And while, yes, there are elements of shame throughout her story that are not real, for her, the issue that started it all, the whole conversation, was actually mistaking shame for anxiety and anticipation. Because this lovely needs to tell her adult children that she is going to divorce their father. She has anxiety about that. That needs to be renamed anticipation because what it really is is not fear. It's excitement for the new life she is building. She's not ashamed to tell them, beloved. That's not the emotion. It's that... How will they react? Will they accept it? Will they be challenged by it? Will they resist it? Will they fight me? And the only disconnect there, or the only thing that needs to be reconnected there, is the knowledge, the faith, and the belief that if we hurt others without the intention of it, right? She wouldn't be doing any of this to hurt them. She's not doing it to hurt her soon-to-be ex-husband. This is not about hurting anyone. This is about doing what she needs for her to live the best, fullest, happiest, most complete, content life possible. She needs to change. And if they don't get it at first, so be it. They will learn by her example. They will learn and they will grow. And so will she. And that's the whole point. Assess your emotion. Is there something that you did wrong? Actually, literally, right? Did you say something mean? Did you hurt someone on purpose? Did you back into their car with yours? (laughs) Right. If there's some literal offense to apologize for, to correct, go take defensive driving, (laughs) then yeah, fix that thing. But most of the time, shame comes from either the unwillingness or the lack of knowing that we can take things apart and learn from them. It all goes back to life school. What did I learn? How did I grow? 
and to look at the new person I am today. It's quite lovely in the end. Until next time, beloved, namaste. Hi beauties, my name is Megan and I couldn't pass up an opportunity to share who Jennifer Hall really is with all of you. Jennifer is a gifted woman who loves to share the tips and tricks of mastering lessons from the universe through real life experiences. When I found Jennifer about two years ago, I did not know what to expect. My past conditioning had me fearing psychics and avoiding them and that was something I overcame within my first conversation with Jennifer. She has no desire to control you or make decisions for you, but she will tell you what's best for your highest good and it's up to you to do the work or not. It's very common for people to seek out a psychic to read the future and sure, it's human nature to want to know what we don't know, to find the certainty in life, but what you actually get through Jennifer is so much deeper than knowing with, with certainty. It's really about how to grow through the uncertainty and embrace the power each of us hold deep within our own sovereignty and untapped gifts. Jennifer has helped me grow through many lessons in life relationship lessons with my husband of 15 years, my gifted and stubborn children, career lessons that involved overcoming complacency and dealing with difficult bosses, and of course, lessons for my spiritual growth and tapping into and embodying my own authenticity. Her podcast, Lessons from the Universe, is food for the soul. It is channeled wisdom, and it is personal wisdom that she picked up as she learned and grew into who she is today. Jennifer is well known and sought out. I have people from all over the world reaching out to me to provide a referral to her so that she can speak with them and, and they're able to meet her. This podcast makes it possible for people all over the world to receive her messages and receive the love that she pours into the collective. If you aren't a patron today, please consider becoming one and donating as much as $1 per month. If all of her beloved fans donated just $1, it would make an amazing impact on her offerings to the world. I meet with Jennifer monthly, and I'm also a patron because I believe so much in the lessons from the universe, and I have witnessed the beauty in learning and growing, the beauty in overcoming and smashing the many bubbles of conditioning that I succumbed to in my past. I have a new, more powerful story, and a big part of this story is embracing lessons from the universe. Your story will continue to change, and your donations will help many others change their stories across the globe, allowing the story of the collective to change for the best as well. If you love and live through the lessons from the universe as much as I do, like, share, and become a patron, and watch lessons from the universe take the rest of the world by surprise in the best ways possible. Sending light and love to all of you. Namaste. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me today for this episode of Lessons from the Universe with Jennifer Hall. If you haven't already, come out and find me on social media. And if you're inspired by the podcast, please consider clicking that little green patron button at the top of the screen. Here, you can help keep us growing and flowing and you can gain access to what I call Jen in real life, that is patron-only content. If you're wanting to learn more, I recently introduced educational sessions specifically to address people's questions that come up around the podcast. These are the only sessions available to new clients, and you can find details in the About section of my Facebook page. I want to send each of you light and love, clarity and wisdom, and know that whether you realize it or not, there's a little brunette with a podcast who's got your back. Until next time, beloved. Namaste.